to the pain. I always have to take this down a little bit. <laughs> here we go. So uh, I've got a question for everybody. How many of you here uh, have a degree in art history? Yeah. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> But I'm going to talk to you about Baroque painting anyway. <laughs> and I'm going to begin with a, a little bit of a, of a mental image that I go through when I try to remember where the Baroque era belongs in history. The era that includes this woman. So what you do is you start at the Renaissance with Donatello and Michelangelo and all the other Ninja Turtles and you... <laughs> And you keep going, and if you've hit Rococo and everything gets super Marie Antoinette, you've gone too far. <laughs> so one of the greatest painters of the Baroque era is the woman right up on this slide, and her name is Artemisia Gentilici. Uh, you may notice that she does not have a ninja turtle named after her. Not even an intrepid journalist or a rat. <laughs> And that is for approximately 400 years because uh, her name was largely forgotten and uh, her fame really only returned uh, in the 20th century with the rediscovery of her work, which we will talk about in a moment. So, Artemisia Gentilici, you are in Rome. It is about 1590 blah and uh, <laughs> very vague. This is history, ladies and gentlemen. And the 15-year-old Artemisia has just painted this Madonna. Uh, the Madonna on the left is believed to be Artemisia's first painting, unsigned, uh, completed very young. Uh, it's thought to be based on a Madonna uh, drawn and painted by her father, uh, Orazio uh, Gentilici, who was also a famous painter. Uh, there is also some argument that it might be the Madonna on the right. But either way, this is some pretty advanced stuff for, say, high school age. Let me tell you, I was mostly doodling on my binder at the age of 15, 16. She was already kicking some very serious ass. Um, this is the lute player, uh, completed by Artemisia at the age of 17, when she was done with her apprenticeship. Um, this is also called uh, St. Cecilia for reasons entirely unknown to me. Uh, check out the non-idealized appearance and high contrast chiaroscuro influenced by Caravaggio. Uh, as usual, uh, the attribution is kind of muddy, and some art historians who don't believe that Artemisia was a great painter are like, oh, this is totally her dad's work. You know, because it's super advanced. This is the next known painting done by Artemisia Gentilici. Uh, it's called Susanna and the Elders. It is her first signed work. She completed it at the age of 17. Uh, and it tells the biblical story of a time, uh, at, at a time when women were mostly limited to painting still lifes and portraits. Um, and she's not just painting a biblical figure. She's doing like a full twisted nude, which is basically the hold my beer while I do this of Baroque painting. This is the sort of thing that you normally, you know, see on the Sistine Chapel. But here she is, 17, busting out the twisted nude. Um, Susanna is a... And you may wonder why Susanna. Uh, Susanna is a hot Hebrew chick uh, in, uh, from the Bible uh, who was falsely accused by lecherous voyeurs. Um, as she's bathing in the garden, having sent her attendants away, uh, two creepy elders spy on her. On her way home, they accost her and threaten to claim that she was meeting with a young man in the garden unless she agrees to have sex with them. Plus ça change. Uh, being righteous, uh, she refuses to be blackmailed by these creeps. Uh, because patriarchy, she is immediately arrested and about to be put to death when some guy named Daniel, because I think this is the book of Daniel, comes along <laughs> and insists that the elders should maybe be questioned before they put an innocent to death. Um, the elders in their, uh, in their testimony cannot agree on the size and type of the tree under which Susanna met her lover. Having been caught in a lie, the elders are put to death, Susanna is set free, and justice! <laughs> 
So basically, this painting is about sexual harassment. Um, to show you how different Artemisia's approach to this whole Susanna and the Elders thing, uh, this is the same subject painted by Guido Reni in 1620. See how much less annoyed Susanna looks? Clearly this was painted by somebody who had never been harassed by elders. <laughs> Here's the same subject painted by Alessandro Allori a few, uh, few years before, where Susanna has gone from annoyed to uh, flirtatiously removing the elder's head from her crotch. <laughs> Now, right around this time, uh, Artemisia is spending a lot of time thinking about sexual harassment by elders um, because she meets uh, Agostino Tassi, uh, the guy who made the painting up here. Uh, this is the fleet of Aeneas. It's sort of a seascape. Uh, he also does a lot of sort of really boring stuff with perspective. Um, <laughs> he worked in Rome with Artemisia, Artemisia's father and spent a lot of time around the Gentilici house. Uh, Orazio uh, allegedly asked his friend to tutor the young, his young and talented daughter, and he obliges by spending months harassing her, and when he finally manages to get alone with her, raping her. So, Artemisia later gives a very detailed account of the rape, which I think we really don't need to get into here, uh, and it included her grabbing a knife and saying that she would kill him for dishonoring her, so she felt a little strongly about this. Um, what does this human garbage fire do next, I hear you ask? <laughs> he promises to restore her honor by marrying her. And this is tricky because he's already married. And, but Artemisia is 17, so, so she believes him. And they have a few more sort of consenty encounters uh, until after months of, I promise I'll marry you, baby. Uh, she's finally had enough. And uh, Tassi says it's never going to happen. And the gentilly, she say... I'll see you in court. <laughs> so the gentle issues take Tassio to court for the rape. Uh, we know a lot about this because this trial, uh, most of this transcript still exists. Um, it was published in Italian in 1981 and English in 1989. And if you think rape trials are tough on victims now, they've got nothing on 17th century Rome. Uh, where Artemisia was subjected to repeated public gynecological exams uh, in order to prove that she was no longer a virgin and forced to, to endure judicial torture. You may ask yourself, what is this judicial torture? Uh, she had to go through the uh, ordeal of the Sibyl, or Sibel. Sibele? I am going to ruin a lot of Italian over the course of this talk. Uh, so this torture involved placing cords around each of the victim's fingers and tightening them around the joints with slip knots until they started to crush her fingers. The theory was that the victim would be unable to lie when forced to testify in such a manner in front of their alleged abuser. Artemisia sticks to her story, even raging, this is the ring you give me? These are your promises? And I have to admit, I am super impressed by anyone who can manage sarcasm while being tortured. <laughs> Tazio, in a move that will surprise no one, was not subjected to torture at all. So, <laughs> let us take a moment to appreciate Agostino Tazi, human garbage, because he starts lying like the gold medal champion in the lying Olympics. He insists that not only did he never have sex with Artemisia, he's never been alone with her in her house. He accuses every other man in sight, including her father, of having screwed her instead. He says Orazio whored her out to his friends for as little as a loaf of bread. He calls Artemisia an insatiable whore and calls in his friends to testify that they've slept with her. Uh, he insults her skills as a painter, saying that Arezio brought her in as a tutor because he had to teach her perspective. Uh, the lies get so bad that the judge starts publicly berating him for his flights of fancy. So, we're not done. Uh, Tazi was convicted, but he got off lightly. Uh, he was given a choice of five years service in the, in the galleys, uh, so the, the big ships, or a uh, five-year exile from Rome. Uh, further accounts of his life as human garbage include the fact that he had been to prison twice before, uh, he had raped and then married his first wife, he had been convicted of incest for raping and impregnating his sister-in-law, and finally, Tazi's wife was missing and he was suspected of having arranged her murder. 
So, you know, good guy. Nice guy to keep around the house. Uh, accounts vary as to whether he ended up serving a year or four months or he got off entirely. Um, but records do show that four months later, human garbage was back in Rome. And this was kind of okay because Artemisia had been married off to a family friend, also a painter, possibly in debt to Artemisia's father, uh, in order to preserve her honor, and they moved to Florence, where they had a daughter, and Artemisia's career really began to take off. So... <laughs> it's like you've guessed the next part. So this is Judith slaying Hol uh, Holofernes. Holofernes? I'm gonna, I promised I would mess up a lot of things. Um, by, uh, by Caravaggio. It was painted in 1599. Uh, the story of Judith, much like uh, Susanna and the Elders, was a very popular one for biblical paintings. Uh, Holofernes was an Assyrian general who was about to destroy Judith's hometown of Bethula. Uh, Judith, along with her maidservant, sneaks into Holofernes' tent when he's passed out drunk and chops off his head. Uh, she brings the head back as a trophy to the townspeople, because she's dope. <laughs> and the townspeople go on to victory over the leaderless Assyrians. Uh, Caravaggio was a big influence on Gentilici, as you will see in a moment. But she painted her own version, and it looked like this. <laughs> Artemidia's Judith was, let's just go with self-portrait. <laughs> And while we don't have any extant portraits of Agostino Tassi human garbage fire, let's just say there was a strong resemblance. <laughs> Both paintings are strongly realistic, employ chiaroscuro, uh, but Caravaggio's Judith is squeamish and a little grossed out. It's almost like Holofernes' head pops off by accident. Um, in Artemisia's painting, Judith is really putting her back into it. <laughs> While well, her maid holds the guy down, there's blood spraying everywhere. And the expression on Artemisia's uh, face um, is described by uh, her premier biographer as a cathartic expression of Artemisia's private and perhaps repressed rage. I'm going with not so repressed. <laughs> the art critic Tom Lubbock refers to this as a slasher painting. For years, this painting was hung in the shadows of the Uffizi Gallery in Florence so as not to shock audiences. <laughs> in Florence, Artemisia's, Artemisia was a big success. She was the first woman accepted to the Academy of, uh, of Arts and Drawing, uh, which is pronounced in Italian and which I will not pronounce in Italian. Uh, she maintained good relations with the most respected artists of her time. She gathered the favors and protection of influential people, including Cosimo de' Medici, uh, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, and the Grand Duchess, uh, Christina of Lorraine. Uh, she had a lengthy written correspondence with Galileo uh, Galilei, a guy that may have come up once or twice in these talks. Um, and during this time, she painted a second version of Judith, as well as this self-portrait of herself playing the lute while looking spectacularly unimpressed. <laughs> Unfortunately, her painter husband had a habit of spending all the money, so they split in 1621, and she returned with her daughter to Rome. In Rome, her work continued to be respected. Uh, she was associated with the Academy of Design, where she was celebrated in a portrait carrying the inscription. Lots of Latin here. I'm not even going to try. <laughs> to paint a wonder is more easily envied than imitated, which is to say, hate has got to hate. <laughs> Visiting French artist, uh, Pierre de Monstier, uh, the, uh, Made, it, uh, made this black and red chalk drawing of her right hand uh, while in Rome in 1625. And while she was respected in Rome, the really big commissions, church altars and such, just didn't come rolling in. Maybe there just weren't a lot of available church altars, uh, altars at the time. Uh, she moved to Venice uh, for a few years, then Naples. And in Naples, she really settled in and started working on her first paintings in a cathedral in Pozzoli. Uh, she moved a little outside of her angry, powerful woman space and created paintings like this, which is uh, the birth of St. John the Baptist, uh, which you can see here. Uh, please note that no one is being decapitated or harassed. <laughs> Girls chilled out a little. 
In 1638, Artemisia joined her father in London at the court of Charles I of England, uh, where Arezio was a court painter and had the extremely important job of decorating the ceiling of the Queen's house in Greenwich. Uh, the, ceiling, uh, the ceiling is not actually at the Queen's house in Greenwich anymore, uh, much to my surprise when I went to go visit the Queen's house in Greenwich. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, at the Marlborough House uh, in sort of uh, downtown London, where it will certainly be seen by more tourists. Uh, there's a good chance that Charles wasn't just interested in the, end, in the uh, elder Gentilici. The king had a vast collection of paintings, which included Artemisia's self-portrait as the allegory of painting with which I open this talk. Years after her arrival in London, uh, sorry, a year after her arrival in London, Artemisia's father died. Uh, he stuck around, she stuck around for a little bit longer to work on her own commissions and then returned to Naples just before 1642 as England was about to descend into civil war between the Roundheads and the Cavaliers. Uh, once in Naples, she continued to do some spectacular and noticeably less bloody work, like the Sleeping Venus. Again, no one being harassed or decapitated. Very chill. Um, there's a lot of debate uh, over the year of Artemisia's death. Uh, some biographers list it as 1652-53, but there's more evidence that she was taking commissions as late as 1654. Uh, either way, there's a good chance she was dead by 1656 because the plague swept through Naples and basically wiped out the entire generation of artists. So that's bad. Now, as proof that haters gotta hate, uh, this is uh, one of her, the... Uh, epitaphs that was written for her anonymously in 1653 by painting one likeness after another I earned no end of merit in the world where to carve two horns upon my husband's head I put down the brush and took a chisel instead <laughs> harsh after centuries of being ignored and passed over and having her work attributed to her father, Artemisia was rediscovered in the 20th century as a great artist and also as a great feminist icon. 30 paintings by Artemisia are currently on display, like you can go see them now as part of a major exhibit in Rome's Palazzo uh, Bresci. Uh, in 2014, the recently rediscovered portrait of Mary Magdalene, uh, which you can see up here, was sold for $1.2 million. Best revenge is cash. <laughs> in 2008, the Florence Committee for the National Museum of Women in the Arts funded the restoration of, this, of her 1635 painting, David and Bathsheba, another painting about a creepy guy spying on a woman while she's bathing. Uh, the work had hung in the Grand Duke's apartment in 1652 uh, uh, and had been languishing in the Pizzi Gallery uh, storage deposits for centuries where it had been badly uh, damaged because it had been stored improperly. Finally, renewed interest in Artemisia's work has also led to closer examination of her paintings. This image uh, shows a reproduction of Susanna and the elders superimposed over an earlier version of the painting, which was made visible using x-rays. In this earlier underpainting, Susanna's pose is less beaten down and scared than raging and defiant. Her mouth is open and screaming, and she holds a knife, just as Artemisia did after her rape, to use against the men who would ruin her reputation rather their own, than their own. Artemisia's work is bought, sold, examined, and debated. Agostino's Tazi's works are largely ignored. His seafaring paintings and technical perspective are considered unfashionable and boring. If he is remembered at all, he is remembered as a rapist and epic garbage person. <laughs> and so I raise a glass. Let's drink. Because the ultimate weapon of revenge is the brush, if the wielder is sufficiently talented. <laughs> <laughs>